All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am with my guest this week, Dan Bekovic, now a four-time MSPT champion. Um, those of you who have been following the Midway Poker story know that uh, Dan and I have a little bit of a history. We are uh, going to be civil during this interview and just really have a postmortem on all things Midway Poker Tour now that Dan has paid back, made full the affected players. Uh, I have confirmed that the players reached out to me. Uh, and Dan, you did so even before the latest win at the MSPT Firekeepers. Uh, I just want to make that clear. And, and you actually well, even, even before that as well, I reached out right. to uh, you in uh, November of 2021 before I even won anything. And I asked for the list to get things going because, uh, you know, it's one of those things I want to take care of, even though, you know, it wasn't necessarily my responsibility, but, you know, the burden was put on me. Right. And we'll get into that. And you did. It was I actually pulled it up November 24th. Um, and I was surprised because it was out of the blue. We hadn't communicated very much uh, for uh, a lot of 2021. And you did say, and I'll read it here. You said, Chad, things are getting much better for me financially within the next 45 to 60 days max. I should be in a position to pay out the eight guys that didn't get paid from the Midway Tour. Uh, and yeah, he said, uh, and you, you asked for my, because I had all the information, the contact info and, and uh, ultimately did make that happen. And we'll get into that, but let's just start from the very beginning. Uh, it was October, 2020, when the Midway Poker Tour took place. It was uh, in the Chicagoland era, area at the, the Sheraton uh, Suites in Elk Grove. It was an $1,100 buy-in main event, uh, 266 entries. And this was during the, the pandemic. There were really no live poker events going on. Um, and the Midway was really one of the only games not only in town in in the entire country so what when did the idea to do the midway poker tour come about and you know what decide what made you decide i'm going to try to to do this during the the pandemic well we didn't we started uh, uh with jason trezak and i had started uh talking about putting a tour together in about february of 20 uh 2020 2021 right before the pandemic started uh we'd actually reached out to a couple of casinos uh we actually had a contract with majestic star casino to host our first event and then the uh you know COVID hit and they kept putting it off putting it off putting it off and you know we had everything ready to go you know we talked to everybody with everything negotiated we were talking to a couple other casinos as well um and nobody wanted to do it because of the pandemic so then we started looking into the legality of the charity route um just hosting it ourselves and doing it that way and it seemed like a great idea um rented out the whole hotel bought all the tables the chips paid by uh, poker news for advertising, advertised a couple other spots, got everything going. Uh, I think we're into the whole thing for about $75,000 for everything to get it going. Um, you know, brought in a tournament director, you know, got everything going. And then uh, basically, uh, you know, it was great first day. Uh, I think it was about a hundred and something players showed up to day one. Um, day two, we had about 150. But the idea behind the whole thing is Illinois gaming laws only allow you to pay out a certain amount over the buy-in. So the idea was we pay in a gift, that gift being a precious, precious metal. Mm -hmm. So the idea was originally we're paying in gold. So we figured first place was going to be about 60,000 bucks. So we had $60,000 in gold. And the idea was, you know, 20th place guy gets his 2000. He doesn't want the gold. He sells it back to our gold buyer. And we just keep recycling the gold and, you know, that's a perfect little way around uh, the payouts. Well, five o'clock on Saturday, the state's attorney comes in and claims we cannot have a gold buyer on site. It's illegal, even though it wasn't. There's no laws or statutes or anything that say we can't. They were just getting a bunch of complaints from people, you know, who obviously a lot of people like me, a lot of people don't, you know, people just complain. So they came in and said, you have to pay out 100%. You can't buy nothing back on site. And that puts us in a predicament because we have $250,000 in cash. It's Friday or it's Saturday at, uh, at five o'clock when they tell us this, every gold store, every coin store is closed. There's no way to get $200,000 in gold at five o'clock on a Saturday. So it kind of put us in a really weird spot. Um, my suggestion was I created a little voucher that said, hey guys, if you, you know, you take this, come tomorrow, pick up your gold at this location. I had a store lined up that would have enough to, to cover everybody. And they could just, you know, come and pick the prize up the next day. If they couldn't make it for some reason, we could securely ship it to them. But the way it works is the charity is the one that holds all the money. Um, we actually have nothing to do with any of it. Basically, we're just a promoter of the event. So the charity decided that they wanted to find a buyer, 
or find a gold or a silver guy who had enough silver to cover everything they needed. And they paid a 30% markup for all that silver, which basically makes they're taking 30% out of the prize pool. I told them like, if you do this, it's a terrible decision. Players would rather wait one day and get their full payout than get paid the same day and be short at 30%. But they talked to somebody who said that it needed to be paid out that day, that it could technically be illegal, they could be sued, and yada, yada, yada. And I told them it was a really bad decision, that we shouldn't do it. And if they did do it that way, I wouldn't be there for day two. That was their choice to make it. But again, I'm the one who promoted it. Uh, it was my name behind it. So I was the one left holding the bag. I mean, everything you just said, I was on site. Uh, as you mentioned, Poker News is there. So I was there. Um, and... It, what you just described is is accurate uh, from from what I experienced and, and, and what I saw. There are a lot of people out there who might not understand the situation as fully, who think that the Midway Poker Tour, you know, was a scam from the get go. Trust um, me, I've heard it all. And so so was it? I mean, I, I don't believe that it was, and I'll explain that too. But um, did you 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 had plans to turn the Midway Poker Tour into you know more than just one stop? Correct. Yeah, this it was, was going to be a full blown tour. I mean, this was just to get us to, to get our name out there because some of the casinos we talked to wanted us to have some results first. They're like, you know, run a couple of them first. And then, you know, yeah, then we'll be more than happy to bring you in. And I said, perfect. You know, we already had Majestic lined up. We had um, uh, the Kennel Club in Florida lined up. And those were going to be our, you know, first two stops that put us on the map. And then the other casinos were getting on board. But then with COVID, it just kept prolonging and prolonging and prolonging. I'm like, this is a great way for people to see how many people will show up. It'll be ran great. It's perfect. We put a lot of money into it. I mean, I put 70,000 of my own dollars into it. People don't understand how expensive it is to rent out an entire hotel for five days, buy 20 tables that are custom felted, an RFID table, chips, cards, buttons, everything, the shirts we give away, the, the money that was spent on advertising to get the word out. Like, where do you guys think that money comes from? Like that came out of my pocket personally. Like, I put all the money into this knowing that this will be a bigger thing. It'll be like, you know, HPT, MSPT. It'll get out there. It'll be big. It, I mean, it still could. It's They just don't understand the business behind it. And they just hear, oh, they got short at 30%. So it must have went into my pocket, which like the people that know, know. I mean, everyone else is kind of right. is, is all hearsay. And I know a lot of work went into the, the planning, as you mentioned, you know, getting all the logistics down and it, the logistics amongst the pandemic. At the time, Illinois had a state mandate that only 50 people could be in a room and you found a way to accommodate that by holding, you know, different tables in different rooms. It, it was for all intents and purposes, a very creative way solution to hold a poker tournament at that time. And likewise with the payouts now, because of Illinois gaming laws, the charitable gaming acts, you, you know, you laid it out, you can only pay $500 in cash above the buy-in. So in this case, $1,600, the rest has to be in prizes. This wasn't something you created per se. There's been other poker right. events that have taken place in Illinois and used this model. And for all intents and purposes, if the, the precious metal buyback plan went off as planned, it wouldn't have been an issue in, in from what no. I observed, right? So if you right. went out there, it was the attorney general coming in and, and altering things last minute that really threw a wrench in it. And that's really where it kind of started to go off the rails a little bit, in my opinion, as a third party uh, on site, because I do remember on Saturday learning of this um, meeting with charity. Your Jason Trezak was there, some others associated with the Midway Poker Tour, the tournament director. You know, we were in a meeting talking about the situation that was unfolding. At one point, I kind of had to excuse myself and say, you know, here's what I feel you need to do, but I also have to excuse myself from this situation any further because, you know, I'm working with poker news and not with, with the charity, with the tour, anything like that. So the, the, I say it went off the rails, Dan, because the one thing that didn't sit right with me and a lot of people and the players too, were that you weren't there. Well, you know, I told them I was upstairs trying to find the solution from trying to find the store that could supply enough gold for what we needed. When I couldn't do that, I started drafting a, basically a certificate which I brought down to them. And I said, it was perfect certificate. You know, had all the, we already knew the payouts and everything. So I, it was, had it laid out for every single player. You're going to get this much in cash today. You come to this location tomorrow and you'll pick up the remainder of your prize. 
I made one for all the payouts. I was up there doing it. It took a couple hours to do. I finally did it, came back down. I said, this is what we do, guys. It's the best way to do it. You know, there, there's no really other solution in my mind besides this. This is the only way to properly do it. And then Charity didn't like it. They said they'd already talked to somebody that says it has to be paid out tomorrow. And I'm like, that's not possible. Find a quarter million dollars in gold now. And at that point, it was about 9 p.m. on Saturday. And, there, and then I told them, like, I, I just, there's no, no other solution to that. And then they came to me about 1 a.m. And they said they found a guy who's got enough silver to cover everybody and that they were paying a markup for it. They didn't tell me how high the markup was at the time that it was going to be a small markup. And in my opinion, small markups, five or 10 grand, you know, not 30%, not $75,000 markup for silver. That's just insane. And I, I told them, I said, if you guys do this, because it's, it, I believe it's, the charity is running the tournament, not us. We're promoting it. And I told them, if you do that, I will not be here tomorrow because it's going to be absolute fucking chaos. When these players realize that 30% of their prize pool went to some guy in Wisconsin, who supplied them with silver coins? It's not going to end well for anybody. Uh, I am not. I am from Wisconsin, but I am not the guy who supplied the right. coins. Just to make that clear to any listeners, yeah, now, the, just... the charity was for kids' sake. Um, they, you know, I got to talk to them while I was on site. They seem to be a smaller family-run charity. I do agree with you in that they were responsible for the event in terms of there were the ones who had the license, their license was at stake. And you are right in that they were worried about their license being revoked and pulled and basically their business and livelihood being, um, you know, diminished if they didn't solve this issue. So they were in a hurry to, uh, you know, find a resolution to it. And they did by overpaying for this silver. Now, the other part though is, you know, you guys and your crew were the ones who were running the poker aspect of it, because I know from talking to them, the charity, this family was not well versed in right. poker. And they clearly didn't understand what was going to happen by overpaying for the silver and what I mean, I, I, I explained that to them thoroughly, that that it, if you take 30 percent of this prize pool away, that players are going to revolt. <laughs> I said, they'll wait one day. They are not going to be mad about waiting one day to get their full prize. And if for some reason people were from out of town, it even said right in the, the, the little certificate I made, we'll securely mail you your prize. And that was the number one solution for me. It was a solution that I thought was best for everybody, everybody involved, everybody get paid. You know, the tour would have made money. The charity would have made money. We would have been reimbursed for some of our expenses. But in the end, I lose $70,000 for putting up the event, all the advertising. Uh, I wound up holding the bag, paying back 30% for everybody who got paid out. Uh, my partner at the time, Trezak, completely just ghosted everybody. No one's heard from him since. And the crazy part is the Midway Tour was owned 100% by Jason. I mean, I owned 0% of this, but was just kind of the face that everybody knew and the one that put it together. And I mean, and it's crazy how it worked out, but, you know, I paid everyone out, got it paint behind us and, you know, hey, maybe we uh, get the Midway Two going. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it does appear that Jason Trezak, his name was all on the paperwork. Um, I can't, uh, you know, argue with that. Um, I do, you know, think that you were putting your face and name to it, as you said. So obviously, to me, it was a kind of a. It was a joint uh, effort. Right. You know? And, you know, it was a, a one way of doing business, I guess we'll say. So you haven't had any contact with Jason Trezak since this all so, went down. So the last message I got from him, it was. Uh, you're a degenerate, take care of your business. Uh, and that was after, you know, we got the whole poker bro stuff. I got everybody taken care of on there. Um, you know, obviously they didn't want us on there anymore because of, you know, the heat. So it just, it was, it was a whole bunch of different things that happened that, that people have no idea about that, you know, and they just rub their mouth and they, they read some things online. They're like, Oh, I made off with a hundred thousand dollars of, of silver when it's the exact opposite. Sure. Not only do I not get to run the, the midway tour anymore we don't get to go to another stop we're out all the money we put into it and i look like the asshole who's robbing all these players all right, and since the situation have you had any contact with the charity at all is there any relationship there I'm, I'm i'm assuming there's no love loss between you and them it was an ugly situation you didn't agree with what they did they were i know from having spoken to them 
kind of just, I, they just wanted out. They wanted to wash their hands of it and, and move on from poker, if you will. Right. I mean, I, I met them. I used to, you know, I have one of the other businesses I have, you know, was wholesale distribution. So a lot of times we get a lot of stuff we couldn't sell. And that's how I even met them. Uh, they were a good organization where I would donate a lot of our, our excess stuff, some of our customer return stuff. I'd give it all to them. They would sell it and the money went to kids for, for this, that, and the other thing, you know, Christmas presents. That's how I even met the charity. They're great people. You know, they just, they're, they're clueless about the whole poker world and poker aspect of it. And that's kind of where that gap came from, where they didn't quite understand the significance and losing 30% of the prize pool, where to them, it was a solution to their problem, but it created just anarchy on the other side of things where, yeah, they got paid out that same day, but 30% of the prize pool is gone, which is a lot. It's more than first place money. So the guy yeah. who supplied the silver got more than the winner of the tournament did. And um, I, I talked to them one time after that. Um, I mean, you know, they didn't, they, you know, acknowledge what happened. Like I said, hey, you know, we understand, you know, you had all the best intentions and, you know, no bad blood there or anything from them. I want to ask, so, uh, you know, the charity didn't really make any money off this situation, um, you know, aside from maybe a few hundred bucks in a tip jar. Did the hotel get paid out? Did the dealers get paid in this in this whole situation? Every, everybody was paid. Uh, the, the hotel was paid. The dealers were paid. Uh, Poker News was paid. Tournament directors paid. Everybody was paid personally out of my pocket. Um, like I said, uh, my partner, Jason, uh, didn't pay for a single thing. Um, kind of just ghosted the whole situation because nobody knew who he was. No, His name has never been brought up one time throughout this whole thing as what the thousands of articles that were written, his name doesn't appear one time. It's always Midway Danny, Danny Midway, Dan Bekovac, not once from him. So, I mean, it all fell back on me. I paid for everything and, you know. I, I th yeah, I, I had, I, I know I wrote about Jason at least once. Uh, I'll say that because I was rereading my notes today, but <laughs> it did seem like Jason was, I don't know, a patsy a little bit. Uh, like he didn't seem like the brains of the operation. You know, well, he wasn't. He was. He was my partner. You know, I, I things. You know, we we created uh, everything together on Poker Bros, and you know, just kind of. You know, no, he was uh, the right hand man to get everything done. Sure, but he didn't really do too much. Now it seemed right after this debacle happened. You know, your Poker Bros club was still running, and you did start paying back some players right away. And it seemed to me kind of the plan at the time was you were going to make these players whole. You know, use via the online. Uh, uh, online operations, if you will. I mean, is that accurate? Yeah. Um, I mean, it wasn't necessarily the plan, but I mean, it makes it easier when you have, you know, uh, revenue coming in to pay people back faster. Um, you know, when that happened, you know, and with the heat that was on us, uh, the administrators over in that app said, you know what, hey, we, we don't want you to participate anymore. We're going to go ahead and move your players uh, to here, there and over there and, uh, you know, ask you to kindly leave the app. So right. that uh, took away a lot of revenue that was coming in. Um, again, so people look at it like I'm making all this money. I lost more money than people you'd make in 10 years off that one event. Right. Um, the Poker Bros app did get shut down. That's kind of when we stopped hearing from, from you, from Jason, from the whole Midway thing. There was some silence until uh, 2021 when you surfaced to play at the MSPT in Grand Falls, um, obviously caused quite a bit of a stir. There were a lot of people upset, were offended that you, you know, showed your face and were playing with some of the same players who might have been impacted. Were you, uh, you know, what was your thinking going to play? Did you feel the heat from it? Did you care? No, Did you say kind no, of not at all? Because I mean, I know that I did nothing wrong. I, I, I lost so much money in the deal. I put together something that was supposed to be great and. It was beyond my control. The outcome was beyond my control. It's not like I went out and personally fucked somebody or cheated anybody. I tried to put on a good event and do something for the players, and it didn't work out. I tell people, you know, you can't hit home runs if you're not swinging for the fences, and that's what happened. So I feel no shame in anything, and the people the people that know, people that were involved in the operation know what happened. They, they know the true story and that it was nothing but good intentions and – it should have worked very well and everybody should have made a lot of money. So no, I feel nothing for nobody. You know, you're going to have those random couple people that are going to talk shit in person. I think there's one person the whole time that's actually said something like, 
completely negative to my face. You get all those keyboard heroes that want to just talk shit that have no idea, like how much goes into what we did, how much money goes into it and the everything behind it that just kind of got fucked up from, from one person coming in and saying, you can't have a gold buyer on site. Like, it's crazy that that one little scenario caused this butterfly effect that, you know, affected so many people. But at the end of the day, the only real person it affected was me. Uh, everyone else was made full. Everyone else got paid. Everyone made money except me. So, but I got karma on my side, you know. I agree with you in that. And I'll say it clearly for, you know, listeners. And, I, and I've said this throughout. Like, I do not believe, based upon what I experienced, that this that midway poker tour was set up as a scam and that there was intentions of any nefarious intentions like i do believe there was good intentions that you were trying to do something good for the poker community and build a business in, in a poker tour but that circumstances that we've talked about changed that i have said it and i think this is kind of where things really went south between you and i was the day this happened that sunday day two of the tournament again you weren't there you did say that you told them if they did this you wouldn't be there but it being on site, being in the thick of it, it was a messy situation. And I think it would have helped a lot had you been there to facilitate. It was not a good look. Um, you know, the players were very upset. Do you, do you understand, you know, how that looked? And do you have any regrets about not being there? Or do you think, you know, if you could go back and do it over again, that you would? If I can go back and do it over again, I would have just forced them to do what I told them to do. Just told them that, look, you know, you're this is the worst decision you could ever make. Like, looking back, like... I, I, I could have been harder on them and just forced them to do it. But at the time when I had spoke to a, an attorney friend of mine, he told me not to be involved in the money at all, that it's actually illegal for me to be involved in the money with them. So I didn't want to push them too hard. I mean, I was there as basically an advisor. I'm a paid advisor at that point, essentially. And I advised them to do this. They didn't do it. And I, I mean, should I have been there? Maybe, but I told them not to do it over and over and over told them I wouldn't be there if they didn't do it. And they still did it at the end of the day. I mean, it was their decision. Um, I, I think it would have been better if I was there, but I don't think it would have changed a single thing. Sure. Here's a question. Um, and you can correct me if my, my math is wrong on this, but I, I've crunched the numbers in the past. So apparently there was a, the prize pool was $258,000. Um, that's what they had to go, uh, you know, account and buy a lot of silver with. But that's assuming the prize pool after fees were collected, which were $34,580. So a question that has come up and has never really been answered is whatever happened to those fees that weren't really taken into the equation of buying silver? Uh, we had some people that had did buy in uh, ahead of time that was paid um, through Bitcoin and some other things. There was some satellite winners that went in and we had talked to the charity ahead of time about them absorbing some of those costs that were going to go to us basically as for, you know, advertising fees, hotel fees, everything. And they were okay with that. So that was something that was pre-discussed. That was essentially going to be, you know, our consulting fee for running the event. Sure. Uh, another thing, Dan, that I got to say that was just left a bad taste in my mouth the day of was as this was going down, you know, you were hard to reach, almost unreachable. And you did go to your social media and start changing some pictures. You know, there was a, fit, a photo on your Facebook of you wearing Midway gear, and then you changed it to a picture of nothing to do with Midway as this was all unfolding. And it just seemed to be... Well, that, that was after it happened. It, that was advice from my attorneys to take down just anything because we knew that people would go in and just start, you know, talking shit like they did. Um, he told me to just take down anything poker related. Um, so that was on the advice of an attorney who just told me to do it and just, you know, kind of stay silent until we figure out the best solution to the problem. All right. Well, I, I, you know, can understand if it's legal advice. Uh, I, you know, I do think it was kind of the fuel on the fire, but though you did, uh, eventually reach out to me, you did issue a statement and, you know, an apology for what had transpired and did make it known at the time that you hope to make players whole. And then, as we said, you did begin that, um, you know, via kind of using the poker bro operation to, to make some players whole. So some were made whole right away. Then it was a while until uh, to the well, happen. I mean, so what would happen is when I was talking to my partner, Jason, you know, we talked about just, Hey, let's just bite the bullet. You know, it's, at the time it was going to be about $50,000 out of pocket, uh, which wasn't that big of a deal. You know, he had over a hundred thousand in his account. 
I had most of my money put up already for this event, expecting money to come back and go forward. So I paid out all the smaller players right away out of my, my own money that I had left. And the idea was he was going to be paying off those final table players. So that's why everyone got paid right away. Those bottom players, you know, I used all the remaining funds that I had to pay off the 400, 500, 600, 700, $1,100 winners that were still owed. And then Trezac was supposed to pay off the bigger ends out of his pocket. And that's when, uh, you know, I got the text, to, I'm a degenerate, take care of my problems and haven't heard a single thing from him since then. Uh, are you a degenerate? I uh, used to be, yeah, yeah, not no more. Now I'm just a, you know, four-time champion, greatest of all time. It, uh, it is an impressive feat, um, and I, I will talk to you about that because, you know, I had the opportunity to, to play with you, but let's fast forward then. So it was uh, 2021, uh, you, you know, had played a bit, but there wasn't much movement until you reached out to me in November, as we talked about at the top of this interview, uh, saying that you, your financial situation was changing and you were interested in, in making players whole. Now, I said it took me by surprise and it did because you could have just tried to wash your hands of it. You probably deal with the stigma for, for forever, but you... I'll, I'll still deal with the stigma. Even though everybody's paid, people will still talk shit. People will still say that I did this, that, and the other thing. I mean, the thing about me at, forever, people just love to hate me. You know, you either really like me or you really don't like me. There's, there's kind of like no in between. And and the stigma, I just is one of those things I don't like to owe people money and I don't like the feeling of people thinking I owe anybody money. So it was always in my head that these people need to get paid. Obviously, um, I started a business that was doing very well in Chicago. Uh, that's when I reached out to you and said, let's get these guys taken care of. And then it just so happens to be that, you know, I win a tournament. That makes it a lot easier, a lot faster to pay these guys back, you know, when you got a bunch of money. Um, but that stigma is still going to be there even now, even though everybody is paid in full. There's nobody that's owed a single dollar for anything. Either people will still talk, even on Twitter the other day. So I bag up the chip lead and, you know, I'm holding up the four. And I got a guy, oh, this is the guy who, who knocked me out. He, he owes all these people money and, and he's winning. And it's just people, they're just going to talk shit no matter what, start to finish. It'll never change. You... Did pay players back. I want to be clear on the timeline. So in November, you did reach out to me that you wanted to make these players whole. In March, you won the MSPT Riverside. Um, I was there. I actually made the final table. I finished fifth. You ended up winning it. Uh, so we played together quite a bit, and we had chatted a bit while we were there and you know, had another conversation about the players getting made whole. And then when you won, reached out and kind of amped it up asked me to put you in contact with everybody, which I tried to, to help facilitate. And little by little over the next month or so, um, you know, you were at the MSPT running aces, made some players whole, made some online. You, they, you, they were uh, messaging me to confirm that they were getting. Yeah, every, every time I paid somebody, I said, just make sure you message Chad so he can take you off the list. And I didn't want to do this. I mean, I, there were so many people, so many podcasts and that reached out to me and wanted me to be on there. And I'm like, Listen, not until, you know, the last person's paid. Do I want to talk to anybody? I don't want to talk to anybody. Be like, well, you paid most of the people back, but not all of them. I had messaged uh, uh, Renato and um, second place guy. I uh, can't remember his name um, offhand that, you know, uh, what event would they be at that? You know, hey, I'll be at Firekeepers, you know, for sure to just meet there and we'll get you finally paid off there. Um, deal I made with everybody was, you know, hey, whatever you're owed. You know, you can get 100% of it. Just give me a 1099 or I'll give you 75% of it in cash. And uh, all the players except two wanted cash. Two of them gave me a 1099. So everybody's paid in full. Uh, Midway is completely off my mind. Um, you know, everyone's made in full. And, you know, obviously good karma. I pay everyone back and, you know, I win another major tournament. I know there's certainly others who, you know, have a different perspective on, on that karma situation. You know, they, the haters. They, they always will. They always will. Um, I, I hope that the, this conversation has helped clarify some things to the listeners. Um, it is based upon, uh, you know, the, the, from what you have shared is what I've experienced. I was ready to, you know, call you out on certain things that might conflict with what I either knew or experienced. Um, and, and I feel you're very, you know, pretty open about what transpired. Um, you know, I, I'll maintain that, you know, I, I still wasn't a fan that you weren't there that day. Um, and uh, maybe a lot of damage could have been avoided, but, um, it is what it is. And it, uh, you know, the fact that you have made players whole, um, it, it, it 
it is something you didn't have to do. You could well, have I walked away. Ignored it and not done anything. But again, like a lot of people are even saying that a lot of people that know me well and a lot of people in the poker community, uh, some big names are like, there's no point for you to pay people because even when you pay them off, they're still going to talk shit. Oh, well, you only won because you ripped these people off and now you had these buy-ins two years later. And uh, even when you pay people back, oh, well, it took you two years to pay them back. It's just like, but it's something that needed to be done. Um, I did, didn't feel right with me. You know, it's at the end of the day, it, it, I was a person behind it. So I felt it was my responsibility to just make sure it's taken care of. And, you know, it's going to open up doors in the future for other things. You know, it always does. You know, when you do good things for others, good things happen to you. Let's talk about the MSBT real quick. Um, it's, it is impressive. I, I can't deny it. I think there's others out there, no matter if they, they hate you, to win four MSBT titles. It's never been done uh, before. And to win them, you, so you have previously won two in Wisconsin, uh, and then you won the MSBT Riverside, as I mentioned, back in March. And that was a, a big field. Um, let me pull it up here real quick. That was... A 1,094 entry field, the largest tournament ever in Iowa. You finished first. I say I finished fifth in that one. So I have a lot of knowledge there. Uh, so very tough field, very impressive. And then you come here just this past weekend and go over to Michigan and top a field of 2,330 entries to win that one. Um, biggest, biggest field in Michigan history, too. Yeah. It's... Um, Clear, like you, you crush these MSPTs. Uh, you know, is there any secret to your to your poker success? I mean, having played with you at the final table, I've experienced firsthand what you you know. If you build up some chips, you apply a lot of pressure and, and play pretty fearlessly. Yeah, I mean that that's that's the key, really. Uh, I tell everybody, three bet, C bet is a, is a key to success. Uh, you know, I bet I've been on a heater. I even was down at the WPT uh, main event down there for in Florida, the Hard Rock. I was chip leader with 40 left with a million up top. Um, just got a couple of cold decks there and just uh, aggression. I mean, it's I got, I got a very unique style that just allows me to just accumulate chips. I go with my reads, um, you know, with three betting is obviously my key to success. Um, you are in the lead now for MSPT player of the year, a comfortable lead after winning two events. And there's still you know half the year to go. Is that something that is on your mind and you might make a, a play for? I mean, it, it's not really on my mind. It's not something that I'm chasing. I mean, obviously, it's going to be hard to beat uh, when someone wins two. Uh, it's not really big of a prize. I think they, they take a couple thousand out of each of each uh, prize pool, but only pay out, like, I think it's, what, 5,500 bucks to the winner. So, I mean, it'd be a nice little bonus, you know, something to just hang my hat on that I got player of the year, um, but not, not something I'm necessarily chasing, you know. Right. And that's kind of where I want to end this. Uh, my last question to you, you know, we talked about the MSBT winning four, maybe winning player of the year and kind of just legacy and reputation in poker. After everything you went through with Midway, what you've experienced, and now that you have made players whole and are hoping to put this in your rearview mirror, you know, what are you hoping for in terms of kind of how people might view you or how they should view you now? I mean, love me or hate me, I'm, I'm still going to be an obsession. I mean, people are still going to talk about me no matter what, uh, good or bad. Um, one of the big things I am working on is uh, for the last couple of years, been working with the state gaming board on legalizing poker, uh, almost Texas style. Uh, I've met with the senators a couple of times now about that, um, just modifying the gaming rules. So where we can allow those, those club styles uh, in Chicago and Illinois, and then also just maybe modifying it so it's a full poker casino almost like you know california style where it's just uh they tried to put it through a while ago where it was you know all the card games you know baccarat blackjack you know three card poker and it was denied so i reintroduced that bill to have it to be poker only you know hold them stud omaha stuff like that so it's actually in uh, review right now and um you know that's that's where I'm trying to build my legacy is, is changing the Illinois gaming laws and making it so, you know, we could have more poker in the state of Illinois instead of how it is now because the charities aren't set up right. And a lot of them are wishy-washy. Uh, there's only one casino that has poker now in Illinois. So if anything for my legacy for who I am as a poker player would be to bring that to the state of Illinois and, you know, put that notch in my head.
I, I want to ask just one last question. This is more out of personal curiosity, and uh, I should have asked it, you know, during the interview, and I never got an answer. You know, after this midway stuff went down, was did the state or any any body, it, it you know, do any sort of investigation? Did anybody ever reach out to you? Because it did seem to me that the AG's office was they didn't care about the specifics. They just said you just got to buy this silver. We don't care about the specifics. What you pay for? I, I got I got not one call, email, show up. I heard nothing from nobody about anything. Um, I mean, I honestly feel like the only reason he was even there is because people were complaining about it. The charities that, that run now, I mean, they have $200 buy-ons that pay out six, $7,000 in cash. So it's, it happens all the time. We were just looked at because at the time it was the biggest tournament in Illinois history. So people had their eye on it a little bit more. And I think a lot of people were complaining, probably the other charities, because if, you know, this went well and we ran it a well, we would probably take a lot of business from them. I think that was part of the reason why a lot of people were complaining. And I mean, I honestly feel even if we had the gold buyer on site, there would have been no repercussions, but I mean, he showed up, we got to do what they want. I mean, just state attorney of the state of Illinois. I mean, so it's not one of those things that I'm really gonna, you know, sure. argue with, you know, it is what it is. Uh, they did what they did and it's kind of all we could do, but yeah, nothing from anybody after the event. Well, Dan, I appreciate you, you know, taking the time to come on to share your side of the story. Um, I think it's good that you did what you did for the players. I'm, I'm sure they're very happy. And I, like you, look forward to putting the, the midway debacle in the rearview mirror. It's, you know, consumed um, your life. And it's something that I've had to contend with, you know, since it, since it transpired. And, um, you know, congratulations on the win. And it sounds like I'll, I'll likely see you at some uh, events in the future. Absolutely. I'll see you soon, buddy.